Yeah, of course. And Archer, could you make Savita a co-host so she can share her screen? Yeah, so thank you all so much for being here and big thank you to Savita, who's our next speaker. And she's actually quite different from a lot of our previous speakers because she was in our shoes up until very recently. So she just graduated high school earlier this year and she's a rising freshman at Stanford University. And in high school, she was able to accomplish a lot of really amazing things from starting multiple nonprofit organizations to doing really cool science research. So she's here to give some of her advice and stuff like that. So Savita, whenever you're ready, feel free to start. Thank you so much, Katie. Just give me a moment to share my slides. Okay, awesome. Is everyone able to see that? Yeah, we can see it. Okay, awesome. So thank you so much to um, Washington Next Generation for having me here today. And thank you to Katie for reaching out to me. I'm very excited to be here today and speaking to all of you. So today, I'm just going to be talking to all of you a little bit more about my journey um, throughout high school. And I want this to be more of an informal conversation. So throughout my presentation, please feel free um, to jot down any questions you have and send them over to Katie or just in the chat. And I hope to leave um, a substantial amount of time at the end for open Q&A where you can just ask me any questions you might have. So um, I'll go ahead and get started with just a brief introduction. So I'm Savita, I'm a Seattle native, and um, I'm not sure how many of you are from the Seattle area, but for those of you who are, I went to Interlake High School in Bellevue, Washington. And um, I am quite simply a lover of all things art. I love the performing arts, I love going and watching art, um, and I also love fashion, particularly upcycling and thrifting and food. And um, some of my favorite quarantine activities of late have just been baking, YouTube workouts, Zooming with multiple people, hiking, and also reading memoirs. And as you can see here, Educated by Tara Westover has probably been the, my favorite memoir that I read. So I would highly recommend that if you haven't already read it. And um, as Katie mentioned, I am an incoming freshman at Stanford where I plan to study computer science. Cool, so today I'll be talking a little bit about my journey with CS and art, and then move into my work with nonprofits and community outreach, and then I'll share some of my key takeaways and lessons from my experiences, and then I'm gonna open it up to all of you to ask me any questions you have. Okay, so this is kind of a glimpse of me as a person. I'm an artist. I dance, I sing, I play the violin, and I really love art, but I'm also a scientist. I love computer science and researching problems in healthcare. And so a lot of people often view these two fields as very disparate and different, um, but I don't like to think of myself as just an artist or just a scientist, but rather I like to view myself as someone who's a human-centered creator. And so my passion lies in bringing together my background in the arts and the sciences to effect change in my community. And this has primarily been through my research as well as my educational outreach. So, a little bit more about the arts. I started learning Indian classical dance or Bharatanatyam when I was around five years old. So I've been learning for over 12 years. And as I mentioned, I also do Indian classical vocal and I play the violin. And for me, um, it has been a constant throughout my life. They have been something that has helped me to express myself, my identity. And in middle school, um, this became more um, prominent than ever, uh, because that's when I started to realize that I could actually use dance to choreograph about topics that are close to my heart. So on the left here, you can actually see pictures from a piece that I choreographed on Van Gogh's struggle as an artist, and it was actually set to a poem that I wrote inspired by the Starry Night and Van Gogh's experiences as an artist. And um, it was also in middle school that I began to realize that um, the arts were not an opportunity that everyone in my community had access to because, um, as you all probably know, the arts are the first target of budget cuts in schools and 
Um, they're often viewed as a luxury when in fact, I really think that they are a necessity. I mean, um, so many things I've learned from the arts have been transferable to other aspects of my life, like academics, leadership, um, connecting with people. And so I really think that they are something very necessary when we educate students. And that's really what inspired me to take the next step and found Art U. So, Art U um, is a nonprofit that I co-founded with my older sister, who is also a dancer back in 2014. And our goal is to raise awareness of diverse art forms, to tackle the widespread lack of funding for arts education, and to make art more accessible to youth in need. And we have four core initiatives that help us to accomplish those. And I'll talk a little bit about each one. So the first one is called Art Connect. And the idea of Art Connect is that we hold these interactive lecture demonstration sessions that are led by youth for youth. So um, examples of topics that we've covered in this workshops have been uh, dance, visual arts, and poetry and we've had um, students from our team go around to different centers in our community for example the international seattle children's friendship festival or the boys and girls club to go around and conduct these sessions our next initiative um, is art kit where we kind of extend the impact of our art connect sessions by providing students who attend them the supplies they need to actually continue practicing what they've learned in our sessions. So over the past couple of years, we've distributed over 500 art supplies. And um, we also recently launched an initiative called Art STEAM in which we combine both art and STEM and we hold workshops um, that focus on the intersection of these two fields. And I'll touch upon this more with my work with another nonprofit later on in this presentation. And finally, kind of our um, most intensive initiative is Art Create. And that is every year we hold this really cool showcase where we bring together youth artists in so many different artistic disciplines like classical Indian dance, Western classical music, poetry, martial arts, visual arts, uh, the list goes on and on. And um, we have the showcase, you can see a picture here um, in the center of one year. And um, over the past five years, we have had five showcases and over 100 youth artists participate in 14 artistic disciplines. So it's always just really amazing to see the incredible pool of talent and just how inspired everyone is after they leave our showcases. So um, that's a little bit about my work with Art U and I think it's been really meaningful for me as a dancer to be able to kind of provide that space for other youth in my community to kind of get involved with art in whatever way they can. Okay, so now I'm going to kind of transition to the other half of that Venn diagram that I showed you at the beginning of this presentation. And this is computer scientists. So you might be wondering, how did someone who kind of just spent the first 13 to 14 years of their life more invested in the arts get interested in computer scientists? And actually, I will tell you that um, throughout elementary and middle school, I honestly had no interest in technology or CS. I was always more interested in biology and medicine. I kind of thought I wanted to become a doctor. At a certain point when I was very young, I wanted to own my own thrift shop because I liked fashion and entrepreneurship so much. Um, so the way I actually got interested in CS was after graduating from eighth grade, I saw this advertisement for a summer camp happening at Bellevue College called Coding for Medicine. And the word medicine kind of caught my attention because I was like, cool, um, here's something that I'm interested in. And I guess it wouldn't hurt to maybe like learn a little bit about CS. So in this course, we actually learned Python and we learned how we could use Python to tackle different challenges in bioinformatics and biomedicine. And for me, it was just really cool to see how I could represent these processes that I learned about in my biology class, like transcription, translation, and actually write the code that would take, you know, um, a string representation of DNA and then convert it into RNA and then convert it into like the corresponding amino acids. So that was kind of the first time that I realized that 
you know, by combining computer science and biology, we can actually hope to tackle challenges that are much greater and more complex in scope. So I think by the end of that course, I kind of realized that more than actually being at the front lines of medicine, I wanted to be more on the back end. I wanted to be the scientist who is kind of discovering those cures and doing that fundamental research. And so after that summer program finished, I decided to enroll in APCS my freshman year of high school. And I also began self-studying um, concepts like machine learning by looking at Google TensorFlow tutorials and um, different college lectures online because when I started reading magazines like Scientific American, um, browsing different research articles online, I realized that this intersection of AI and medicine was something that was very emerging back then and something that I kind of wanted to contribute to and help shape. Um, so that was kind of the start of my research journey. And um, my first research project was actually in freshman year, and um, I developed a convolutional neural network model, which is basically a machine learning technique um, that's very effective for image recognition to diagnose melanoma from images, images of skin lesions. And um, this was a very... Um, as you might imagine, for someone who's just starting off their research journey, it was definitely a very difficult and challenging process. I had a lot of setbacks and I was just trying to figure things out, um, but somehow I kind of persisted through it and I actually qualified to present my work at the International um, Science and Engineering Fair. And when I got there and I saw all of these other really cool scientific research projects, that was kind of a moment of inspiration for me. It was also a moment of validation, and I was like, I want to keep on doing this um, throughout high school. So um, that kind of inspired my next research project. Um, I was learning more about biology in school, um, and I was in the advanced biology class, so I learned about how um, enhancers, which are these regulatory elements that can control how a certain gene is expressed. And um, if we can basically identify enhancers, we'll be one step closer to being able to learn more about very complex diseases like cancer and autism. And identifying these enhancers via wet lab techniques or in the lab is very expensive. Um, it requires a lot of labor. And so I decided that I wanted to try and find a computational technique for doing so. So I independently researched machine learning techniques and I also developed an algorithm to identify limb enhancer regions in the mice genome and um, I also had the opportunity to present this at ISAF and various other science conferences so that was very exciting and um, finally one of my most uh, fun lab experiences was probably my summer of junior year where I got to attend the Research Science Institute in Boston. And over there, I got a research internship at the Dana-Farber Cancer Institute, um, which is affiliated with Harvard Medical School. And I got to conduct research on um, developing machine learning techniques to accelerate cancer blockade therapy. So very fundamental level of research. And um, this was in particular very exciting for me because it was the first time that I was kind of in this lab where I got to interact with the wet lab biologists who were actually conducting the, the wet lab side research and getting that data real time. And my job was to then take that data and then do the computational analysis. So that was a very um, exciting and fulfilling experience for me. Okay, so um, the next thing that I'd like to talk about is kind of how I began involved in my STEM outreach. So um, my first time at ISA was exciting, but it was also a little bit intimidating. And here's why. I was in the software category and there is about 70 projects in my aisle. And I was about one of maybe three girls in my whole row. And I felt kind of, you know, intimidated. I felt like the other students around me weren't necessarily as interested in my project as they would have been if I was um, a boy. And I instead just focused on kind of um, putting my head down and, and presenting my research to the adults who passed by the judges. And um, this kind of distance that I felt, this kind of isolation was my first glimpse kind of into the gender gap that is there in STEM. So when I got back home, 
I did a lot of reflecting and I talked to my friends. And I started to realize that um, this problem of diversity of STEM is a lot larger. It actually stems from the fact that different styles of thinking can be perceived as inherently gendered. And I think that's a large problem of why STEM fields are not as diverse as they could be. So for example, um, if you think about it, creativity or being artistic is something that's traditionally perceived as more feminine, whereas being more rational, being more logical is something that's often perceived as more masculine. And the problem is, is that this messaging is actually delivered to children when they're very young. Um, it's, it's there in how STEM is taught. Because, you know, when I was growing up, I think the one of the biggest reasons that I wasn't more interested in STEM is that it was always STEM cam camps were robotics or um, related to gaming, things that I automatically perceived as being kind of nerdy or geeky and not creative enough. And in fact, according to research, boys are actually three times more likely to be marketed STEM toys than girls. So the result of this is actually quite significant. Um, it results in isolation and the lack of representation of women and underrepresented, underrepresented minorities in STEM. And in fact, 60 to 75 percent of the students in university art programs are women, while only 18 percent of those who graduate with a bachelor's in CS are women. So the question becomes, how do we solve this problem, right? Because um, at a deeper level, we see that art and STEM are not mutually exclusive. They actually um, are very symbiotic because um, research has shown that the creativity in the arts is actually very important in STEM fields. It gives us the ability to synthesize knowledge from disparate areas, to draw connections between them, the flexibility to accept feedback from a community and continually iterate on it. And also it promotes collaboration. So the question becomes, how can we change this messaging that is kind of way inherently there in our society? How can we promote diversity of thought in STEM? And that was my inspiration behind founding She Codes Art. So our goal uh, is to promote diversity in STEM by empowering girls and minorities to realize the creativity the creative possibilities and tech and art. And the way we do this is kind of revolutionizing how STEM is traditionally taught. We instead use very art-focused curriculum modules to teach traditional STEM concepts. So um, an example of this is that uh, every week we volunteer at a local after-school center in our area called Jubilee Reach. And over there, we work with younger elementary school students. And we teach them scratch programming, but we have the students work on projects like making music videos, making their own soundtracks, animating dancers. And in that way, we're kind of able uh, to show them the artistic applications of what they're doing and to kind of encourage that creative thinking. And so we've actually been able to reach a lot of people who initially think of themselves as more creative or artsy people and to help them realize that tech is actually something that they can integrate into um, their lives rather than something that they should fear or be intimidated by. So over the years, um, this was founded in 2017, um, we have expanded tremendously. We hold a lot of full day conferences and workshops, um, and we've developed eight art and tech curriculum modules. Um, I think like one of our most exciting conferences was where we did an AI and art summit and we had students create their own mural artwork. Um, we also recently with the COVID-19 situation have been transferring our work to be more online um, with a lot of webinars. So we've done a, a session on teaching students JavaScript with P5, which is a graphics li library for visual arts. And then a workshop where we taught students Arduino and had them actually code a circuit to play music. So um, it's in this way that we've been very successful in kind of um, fulfilling our mission of promoting both artistic thinking and STEM thinking as being something that's more symbiotic. Okay, so now I know I've talked a lot about my experiences and I kind of want to wrap up with the top five lessons and takeaways I learned throughout my journey. So my first lesson is that innovation is much more effective when you think across disciplines. And I know I've talked a lot about how artistic and STEM thinking are kind of 
um, integratable and I'm going to give you an example of that. So actually one of my research projects was coding um, this kind of wrapper class for um, scientists to use to uh, find neoepitope candidates. Neoepitopes are these proteins that are used to develop patient-specific vaccines. And so um, when designing this class, I actually had to think a lot about um, you know, how I would organize things, um, how I would make different functions, what I would put inside of these functions, how, it, how I would make it easy to use. And I found that this style of thinking was actually very similar to the style of thinking that I use in choreographing a dance piece. Because again, it's kind of like we both have these big, um, you know, ultimate goals that we're trying to accomplish. And we're trying to figure out the best way to kind of design that and present that to our audience. So I think that those styles of thinking are actually very transferable. Um, another area in which I have experiences is, as I mentioned in my research uh, internship at the Harvard Med School, um, I got to like translate my knowledge from biology to CS. Um, it was very useful that I had such a deep knowledge of both these areas and that I could very easily talk to the wet lab researchers and understand what they were saying and then take it back to my desk and my computer and code something meaningful. And finally, I also think that it's been very helpful in our outreach. You know, the students who we work with at Jubilee Reach have had very little CS exposure. And so so one of our students, you know, um, had very little interest in learning CS, but um, when I discovered that she loves to beatbox, that she loves to, that she just loves music, it was very easy for me to kind of connect with her in that way and help her make her own program to like play a soundtrack that she beatbox, and that was very effective. Um, I also think that uh, because I have been into the performing arts a lot, I'm very comfortable with speaking and sharing my ideas and communicating eff effectively. And that's something that is very important in science and in tech. When you're making a presentation about your research, you really have to be very concise and effective in how you are explaining it so that you don't overwhelm the person who is trying to understand what you are saying. Um, my second takeaway is that you can have really big dreams. You should not be afraid to dream big. But even though you dream big, you shouldn't let yourself be intimidated by um, the vastness of those dreams. Rather, you should start small, start in a way that's manageable for you. Because um, when you start small, you'll be able to then make very incremental change and build towards your larger dreams. Um, I think that every idea you have you should kind of think about it in terms of a product in that um, it's, a, it's an idea. So now you need to test it, right? You need to kind of create this working prototype and see how well it works. And then if it works well, great. You can start collecting more data, start expanding on that and start moving more towards a kind of final product. So this is the mission. This is kind of the model that I used when growing She Codes Art as an organization. We started off really small. It was just me and another one of my friends. And we went every week to Jubilee Reach where we worked with five students and we taught them scratch programming with music. And um, as the year went on, we saw that this approach was very successful. So that's when we were like, great, now we should probably start developing new curriculum modules in different areas of CS. And we began expanding our reach by doing full day workshops that we could have more students attend. We also did summer camps where we had students um, develop their own like mobile applications and stuff like that. And then once we had all of those really great results, it was so much easier for us to start building partnerships with other prominent organizations in our community. At that point, we were able to start reaching out to places like Microsoft and being like, hey, can we hold a workshop in your space? And we were also able to get, you know, um, software professionals from different companies like Facebook, Amazon, et cetera, to come and speak to our students and um, provide our students those more professional and um, mentoring opportunities. And since then, we have also been growing our impact across the U.S. We have many different chapters, and recently we actually have expanded our executive team to include um, students from all over the U.S. So we have really expanded our reach within the past three years, and I'm very excited to see what we accomplish in the coming year. Um, my third key lesson is that you should build supportive communities because um, really this is where 
you will able to continue drawing inspiration and motivation. I think for me personally, um, when I went to a Women in Tech Summit um, in my sophomore year of high school, that's where I saw so many other girls my age doing such amazing outreach in their own communities. And that's kind of where I got a lot of my motivation <clears throat> and inspiration for my work with G-Codes are. I realized that if they were doing so much amazing work in their communities, it's something that I should start trying to do in my own community as well. And that's, it's been finding these really supportive communities, whether in research or in tech, that's kind of kept me going throughout the years, even when I feel kind of discouraged or feel like, um, you know, things aren't going well in my end. It's something that's been um, kind of there for me throughout. The other thing I would say is that you should really try to connect with that diverse groups of people. I'm from Bellevue, um, which as many of you might know, might know is kind of a minority majority. Um, and my, my high school was also a lot like that. So I think it's kind of easy to kind of get trapped in like one specific type of community, but I think that you should consciously kind of take the effort to go and step into other communities. So for me, that was going and volunteering at places like Jubilee Reach at the Ronald McDonald House where they have students with terminal illnesses, um, going and watching slam poetry shows, and kind of just realizing how diverse different people's stories are and drawing inspiration from that. And I think it also helps you to realize how you can begin to amplify your voice in different communities, how you can um, expand your reach so that you are making the most impact um, for people who need it. And finally, I'd like to end with the fact that it's, it's amazing to have really ambitious goals, but you also shouldn't let um, you know, achieving those goals define your worth. It's okay if, if, you know, if you want to like, for example, build a web application and you're not able to kind of get there instantaneously. Um, all of this is a process. All of this is something that you have to keep on learning and experimenting with. And it's that ex experimentation, it's that process that's a lot more important than the actual results. And um, you shouldn't let the results that you get define who you are and, and get you down. So I would say more than anything, um, be sure to take care of yourself, um, do the things you love, hang out with your friends, you know, find something that makes you happy, know what that thing is and stick with it throughout um, high school or college or anything that you do. So that's about it on my end. And um, I would love to open it up to questions now about my experiences and my journey, um, any questions you might have about my nonprofits, any advice you might want about high school or college or academics or just anything else that you can think of. Um, I want this, as I mentioned, to be more of an informal conversation. I feel like I want to be as um, helpful for all of you as possible by getting your specific questions instead of providing a more generic outline of how high school and college should work. So, yeah. Um, I guess, Katie. Yeah. Um, I really love, like, all your takeaways. I thought they were really insightful. And, like, I also really love the fact that you approached STEM from such an interdisciplinary perspective, because I feel like, especially with high school and college students, there's like this stigma that surrounds like the arts and the humanities where it's like you have to study STEM, you have to study CS or bio and become like a doctor or an engineer. And I really like that you like added more layers of perspective to STEM for so many people. Um, so we have, okay, we already have some questions in the chat. So feel free to keep adding them. And I'm gonna start by asking some questions that people left on the registration form to um, like just to start with. So um, a lot of people asked about like how you conducted your science research, how you chose a topic, especially for ISAF, and like how you found a lab to work in. So could you sort of like walk us through your whole process with mm -hmm. science research and ISAF? Yeah, for sure. So um, I guess I'll talk more about my research. As I mentioned, um, I think the way I kind of came up with a topic was I read a lot of scientific articles. 
um, on like PubMed if like you go and you can kind of like browse by different topics. Um, I also saw like a lot of articles in um, Scientific American and I think like back then like AI and medicine was kind of more of an emerging field and so um, that's kind of where I got the idea for doing that project. But I also think that when you're doing anything with computer science and biology, you're often limited by the data that you can find um, because often um, data is not very easy to discover. You're often dealing with very small data sets and um, that can often become a challenge that you have to deal with in your research. So um, I think that you have to um, kind of just pick a field that you're interested in, try and find all of the existing literature that's there in it. Um, reading there, a lot of times there'll be a very comprehensive review, you know, about everything that's been done in a field, about the challenges and what remains to be discovered. And oftentimes you can kind of look at one of those things that remains to be discovered and think about if there's any way that you yourself can begin to try and tackle this challenge and try and find data for. Um, so that's kind of how my independent research was formed. I also got a lot of like advice and feedback from my biology teachers, especially um, in my sophomore year when I did a more biology intensive project. Um, and as far as like kind of like going through the science fair process, I would say it's definitely a very um, intensive process. So I went to um, CURSA, Central Sound Regional Science and Engineering Fair, and um, from there, they um, I entered in the computational biology category. And over there, they pick, I believe it's two people to attend um, the International Science and Engineering Fair. And actually both years, I did not get selected at Cursive. So um, after CERCEV, you can actually go to the Washington State Science and Engineering Fair. And um, that's a little bit later in the month. And so I went to WASF both years and that's where I got selected to actually attend ISEF because they select about six or seven people to attend ISEF from um, the Washington State Science and Engineering Fair. And um, I think like my key tips for science fairs would be um, to of course, you know, uh, have a good project to make sure that you have um, good results and to kind of be very detailed in how you describe the process of how you arrived at your results. I think that um, your project board and your overall pitch matter a lot in science fairs and as I mentioned sometimes your judges won't exactly know a lot about the area that you're presenting about so you have to make it very accessible um, to anyone who might be judging you but also be prepared to answer deeper questions um, if your judge does happen to know more about your area. Yeah, and how long did that, like, whole, obviously, like, it's, like, a really long, like, yeah. <laughs> like, can you, like, approximate, like, how long it sort of took you to, like? Um, I would say, um, I think I started my, my freshman year project in about August, um, and then the science fair happens in March, so I would say around nine months-ish. Um, you should allow yourself a lot of time, kind of, for that process. Of, you know, finding your topic, um, starting your research, getting your data, and then figuring out what you're going to do with the data. Um, and I will also say another thing that I forgot to mention is um, reach out to labs if possible. Um, I think like generally um, if you send professors like, you know, a resume and a very clear reason of why you think your experience would be helpful for problems they're trying to solve in your lab, in their lab, you can get an internship more easily. Um, but that being said, I do think that you have to have a certain skill set and a certain amount of experience before entering a lab, it, unless it's wet lab. I think wet lab research is a little bit easier to just enter a lab without too much prior experience because it's very hard to get wet lab experience by yourself. Yeah, I think a lot of people in the audience are interested in conducting research of your mm -hmm. own, of their own, so that sounds like yeah. really helpful advice for them. Um, there are a lot of questions in the chat, so Let's just move to those since okay. they sort of overlap with um, questions that we got. So um, someone asked, how do you manage your time to be more efficient? Which I think also like how, just overall, how did you manage your time in high school? Because obviously you had so much going on and then like school on top of all of that. So like- Yeah, um, I think that that's a great question. I think like um, you kind of just, have to like 
tell yourself that you're going to focus on one thing at a time. So I think for me, um, I kind of like made research my primary focus until like March when all of the science fairs happened. And then after March, I would transition to more focusing on my work with Art U and organizing our showcase. Um, but of course you do have to like keep everything that you're involved with um, going on at some level in, in the background. And so I think that just um, for me personally, because I've been involved with leading so many initiatives, um, delegating has been really a great way for me to manage everything. I've been very fortunate to work with a very amazing team of leaders for both, both organizations, Art U and She Codes Art. And by helping people um, on our team to just become independent leaders by themselves, I'm able to like delegate so much more work and we as an organization are able to expand our outreach so much more. So I think that that's some way and that's one way in which you can kind of try and minimize the time that you are spending and get more results um, out of what you are trying to do. Um, I think for me personally, I was in the IB program in Interlake, so that was very time intensive academically. Um, and I also had to do AP. So I think like definitely there are a lot of, you know, days where I didn't get very much sleep but i think just being like so passionate about what you're trying to do um and, and just persisting um you know like having a calendar and and planning your schedule out is very helpful and setting very achievable milestones for yourself on a monthly basis is another great way to start and the other thing i would say is like um if you can't get everything that you're trying to do on your plate like don't try and do it so it's just keep on cutting away until you can get to what you're able to manage because I don't think that trying to do a lot of things and burning yourself out is um, the most effective way to like do anything. So yeah. Yeah, that sounds like really good advice. I'm actually entering the IB program at England. Oh, okay, yeah. Yeah, I'm gonna keep that in mind for sure. <laughs> yeah, for um, sure. We have a lot of questions about Stanford. So like, what are some other schools you got into and like, why did you decide to choose Stanford? Yeah, um, that's a great question. So I think throughout high school, um, Stanford was kind of my dream school. So I actually applied early to Stanford and um, I ended up getting accepted early action. Um, and then after that, I did apply to a couple more schools and I got, um, I would say like my top choices by the end of the process were Stanford, um, MIT, Harvard, and probably UW Computer Science because UW CS is actually like a really great school for CS. Um, and I think um, kind of what drove me the most towards Stanford, um, and it was a hard decision, especially without like all the college admit weekends and stuff this year, but I think what drove me towards Stanford was the fact that their CS curriculum is very practical and the fact that they have a lot of interdisciplinary tracks that you can kind of explore. So they actually like have a bio track and they have an AI track that you can kind of choose to go down on and that I could also kind of keep up my interest in the humanities because they have um, a really great selection of different humanities related majors or minors and that's something that I definitely want to keep up and um, I think as a school they also have like a lot of like cultural organizations so they actually have a great Indian dance team and Indian music team and for me that was kind of another factor about why I decided to choose Stanford. Yeah and um, like in the chat and also in the sign up we got like a lot of questions about college applications mm -hmm. right? A common theme that came up was sort of about having like a theme in your application I guess yeah. like having things that like added up but since you like did so many things and like approached like stem from such an interdisciplinary perspective do you think that was your theme or do you think that like it's not important to have a theme or like what are what are your thoughts yeah. on um, I would say that it's definitely important to have a theme. I think that um, having a strong theme to your application is probably the most important part and kind of helping colleges to see why you did everything that you did in high school. So I think, um, as you said, my, my theme was definitely like my interdisciplinary approach to STEM and also my deep involvement with the arts. And that was, those are kind of the two themes I focused on um, throughout my application. And I think um, I also did a lot of leadership in high school, um, you know, I, with school clubs and also with my nonprofit. So I think that that was something that um, I kind of just like tied into my love for STEM and for arts. Yeah, and people are asking like, questions about extracurricular so do you have advice on like 
finding the right extracurriculars or stuff like that to sort of build up that theme? Yeah, um, I think like if it's great if you kind of have an idea of um, where you want to go, like um, as in like what major you're interested in or like what type of career you're interested in pursuing. I mean, if you don't, that's totally fine. But I would say that if you are interested in getting into a CS focused school, like for example, UW CS or Georgia Tech or something like that, it is quite important to kind of start building up that CS experience in high school um, as much as you possibly can, whether that be like taking CS courses that your high school offers, finding external courses outside that you can take um, and kind of trying to to like work on your own projects. So I would say like hackathons are like a great place to start. Um, you know, like robotics, those types of things are all like great places to kind of like look into if you're interested in STEM. I think if you're interested in, in like a multitude of things, I would say in freshman year of high school, you should like try out a bunch of different clubs and kind of see which ones you like the best. Um, and then like stick with one or two of them throughout high school. Don't try and do like four or five different clubs and just like not be able to put your best foot forward in, in every single one of them, but choose two that you really like and that you really feel strong at and, and keep on working on that throughout high school. Um, and I think like for me personally, because I started the arts so early, that was just something that naturally continued with me um, into high school. And I think like my nonprofit work was also inspired by like a lot of my um, independent work with arts and CS. So, yeah, so um, it kind of just like naturally fell into place for me. And I think like um, you should kind of just stick with what you are genuinely interested in and try and see if there's a way you can really make yourself very deeply involved with that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that sounds like really good advice. Um, so like in regard to nonprofits, like a lot of questions are like, how did you start it and how did you register as a 501c3? Because like that's like obviously like a difficult and expensive process. So can yeah. you like, walk us through that? Um, so as far as like registering a 501c3, um, that was kind of a decision that we made later on with Art U, and by this time we had a much larger team. We also had a couple adult mentors who were kind of helping us out. And I think the main reason why we chose to do it is that when you are a 501c3, you can get donations um, like matched by different corporations and stuff like that. So it makes it a lot easier for you to try and grow the impact of what you're doing. Other than that, I wouldn't say that there's any other significant advantage to being a 501c3. I think that you can like be a nonprofit without a 501c3 status and still be doing really amazing work. Um, so I think that if you want to be a 501c3, that should kind of, you should have like a clear reason for why you're doing it. Um, and then I think as far as the paperwork, it's actually um, not too complicated. I think you have to kind of uh, register with your state like uh, Department of Commerce and then also fill out a couple IRS forms and as long as like your revenue is less than 50,000 or something like that then um, it's not going it's like pretty simple and it actually doesn't take that much time you do have to pay a one-time fee but it's kind of like you're hoping it'll pay off in terms of like what you'll be able to get in terms of like donations and stuff like that for the impact of your organization and yeah do you plan on like continuing your work with um Art you and She Codes Art when you enter college or? Like yeah, for sure. Um, I think like She Codes Art is already something I've started, like we have started planning for in the next year. We have expanded our team like a lot um, and we have like high schoolers and also college students now from all over the U.S. and um, our big focus for this year is kind of transferring our work to be more online, um, creating an online learning platform so that we can continue our outreach at the same scale as we were doing before. Um, in terms of Art U, it's definitely still something I want to continue but it's also something our team has to do some more thinking about because so much of our work before relied on in-person outreach and in-person connections so I think it's something we're still thinking about yeah and like for your team like how did you find those people like how did you find the right people to like start yeah that's a that's a great question and I think like um whenever you're you're recruiting people for your team you need to make sure that they are genuinely interested in in the larger goal of your organization right so i think like for me um it was actually mainly just people who came to our showcases for art you and were so inspired and they just wanted to like organically join the organization themselves and um my i guess like my philosophy was always like 
I will accept anyone who's like genuinely interested or passionate about this onto the team and we'll find something for them to do. Um, and I think like being really welcoming, um, making sure you're getting people who are interested is something that really helps you to grow your team more organically. Um, another way which we use for She Codes Art was um, we released staff applications um, and we actually had a lot more people than we expected who filled out those staff applications and we conducted interviews for them and we chose people who we think will be really valuable additions to our team in terms of skill set and also like just um, general vision and stuff like that. Yeah, like something I've heard a lot is like, like experience is important, but like passion ultimately is more important mm -hmm. than Experience. Yeah, for yeah. sure. I think like even um, if you're taking students onto your team and they're really passionate but they don't necessarily have as much experience, um, you should kind of make allowances for that and they can like learn a lot just from joining your organization and doing outreach themselves. Yeah, that makes sense. And some people are asking about your CNN. I don't know what that is, but um, did you get outside help with it? How did you become comfortable enough with the CS and AI to create your own CNN. Can you like tell me what that is? Oh yeah, so CNN is a convolutional neural network and um, it's basically a machine learning model that you can train with image data to then recognize new image data that you give to it. Um, and so in terms of like how I kind of got started with that, um, I did a lot of the TensorFlow tutorials and um, I also knew Python. Python is an incredibly powerful knowledge to know when you're trying to do machine learning research because there's so many um, inbuilt packages and libraries and stuff that you can use that are fairly easy to use actually. Um, so I think I used Keras um, to build the model and it's actually like not very complicated in terms of code. Um, but I think like a challenge that I definitely had um, was like getting the model to like accurately distinguish between the benign images and the malignant images because there is so much more of um, the benign images than the malignant images just because of the natural imbalance in the data set. Um, so I had to, I actually ended up using um, this model called Microsoft ResNet that has been trained with like thousands of classes of images. And by using this technique of transfer learning, um, I was able to then take this model and um, you know, have a more accurate model that was more accurately going to be uh, distinguished between the two classes of images. Mm, that's really cool. Yeah. Um, so, okay, wait, so clarification. So was the novel part of your project the architecture or a different application? Um, it was basically the application, I would say. Yeah, I think the techniques that I used were fairly standard. I would say that I had more novel aspects in my second project where I actually had to do and investigate a lot of different data balancing techniques because again, the data set was really small and imbalanced. And I also investigated many different types of machine learning classifiers. And um, I investigated so many different combinations and that kind of comprehensive and systematic approach to it was kind of novel because nobody had done it in that area. So, yeah. And I'm not sure if you want to relive these experiences, but someone's asking about like what AP and IV classes you took and like what your course load was like. Yeah, for sure. Um, so in terms of IB, I, um, at Interlake, you pretty much, I was like in the accelerated program. So we do IB in 10th and 11th grade. Um, and so you pretty much are on track to do history and English HL. So unless you really don't want to do an HL one of those subjects, you pretty much just end up doing that. And the third higher level exam I chose was physics. Um, my standard level classes were bio, Spanish, and math. Um, and then in terms of APs, I basically tried to take um, any APs that I felt like would give me college credit and ones that I also was just like already learning material for in class. So freshman year, I took AP World and AP CS. In sophomore year, I took AP Bio, AP Calc, AB, um, AP, <laughs> AP, um, <laughs> like the AP language and then AP, A push. And then um, in junior year, I, I took like Calc BC, um, both the physics C tests, which I actually self-studied for. And that was kind of an interesting experience. <laughs> um, and AP Gov. And then um, senior year, I just took AP Chem because it was something that I could get credit for, but I didn't bother taking any APs that I couldn't get credit for. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
and like since you you did full IB right so like why did you make the decision to also take so many AP classes um I guess like intro like they kind of just like try and teach you both um they try and teach you AB curriculum they also try and teach you IB curriculum um I'm not sure how like successful it is but um you do it and a lot of people end up taking AP class um tests as well and I think like the main um I think the main advantage of that is that um, you can get college credit for AP classes a lot more easily than you can get college credit for IB classes because colleges pretty much only take credit for IB higher level exams, higher level exams, and then even then you still have to get like a six or, or a seven on them, so which is kind of hard to do. So I would say that APs are just um, a great way to kind of have that safety net and also ensure that you are getting the credit that you need for college. That makes sense. Um, is participating in robotics beneficial for someone who's interested in CS and bio? Um, I guess like I never personally did robotics. Um, I would say that robotics in general um, is kind of, I think, like an activity in it by itself, um, just because I feel like it takes a lot of time commitment because you have to like spend so much time with your team um, and like build the robot and program it and stuff like that. Um, so I think like it's definitely like a really great extracurricular if you de if you're deeply invested in it. But I think that if it's just something that you're trying to like add to like your list of things to do, it's probably not going to be very helpful. Um, in terms of CS and bio, um, I would say like. It might be helpful if you want to like build like a robotic device for healthcare or something like that. But um, yeah, in terms of like pure CS and, and bio research, I'm not very sure. Yeah. Yeah, that's interesting. I've always like thought about robotics and CS as being sort of like kind of the same thing, but it's sort of like interesting to think about their differences. Yeah. <laughs> um, so since there are so many questions, I sort of like synthesized a lot of these. So if you have okay. something more specific to at, like for the audience, like if there's something very specific that she wasn't already able to get to, feel free to ask it. Um, oh yeah, um, let me just switch to the slide. You can like reach me um, on LinkedIn or Instagram or email um, with whatever questions you have and I'll turn it back to you. Um, yeah. Um, you absolutely do not have to share this if you're not comfortable, but people are asking like, I guess they're like thinking about the college apps side. So like, you don't have to share this if you don't want to, but people are asking about your GPA and your SAT and ACT scores. Okay, um, I guess like I had a 4.0 GPA, but um, in terms of the SAT and ACT, my general advice would be, um, colleges don't actually care about that as much as you think they do. Like, I would say that a lot of people become very fixated on doing SAT and ACT test prep and trying to get, you know, a perfect score on both these tests. And I would say, like, that's something you should probably not waste your energy as much as on. Um, I think for me, my personal philosophy was to focus a lot more on, on learning things with my AP and IBs. And I think that's helpful for me, not only as a student, but also, like, um, just in terms of, like, um, having, like, good coursework to like show colleges when you're applying for them yeah like for me personally like I really hate just the whole like idea of standardized testing so yeah. like the counselors parents teachers like they put so much emphasis on like exactly yeah I think like a lot of college um I guess like a lot of like yeah adults will make it sound like oh your SAT or ACT score is like your end all be all but really is just like a very small portion of like what a college is looking at and as long as you pass a certain threshold um, I would say you're pretty much good to go. Mm -hmm. um, another question about nonprofits is when should someone start a nonprofit? I'm not sure if this is referring to like when as in like a stage in your life or when as in like a time of year but like what do you think um i would say like you should start a nonprofit if you have an idea that you feel like um would solve a need in your community um and i think like you don't necessarily need really any experience to start a nonprofit. i think like you can pretty much start a nonprofit at any time as long as like you know you have an idea and and you feel like you have a means of like as i mentioned you should like start prototyping that idea in whatever way you can even if it's like a smaller um 
you know, initiative or something like that. So I think like you should start a nonprofit if you're genuinely interested in something and you perceive that there is a need for, there is like a need for that issue to be solved in your community. But I also like don't think that you should start a nonprofit for the sake of starting a nonprofit because I think a lot of people do that and, um, you know, it, it has to fit together with like what you're overall interested in and like what your greater passions are. So I would say like if it's like a more generic topic or something like that, you could go ahead and join an existing organization and just be very deeply involved with that organization and that's still equally as valid um, as long as you're doing like very deep work and significant work for your community. Mm -hmm. And like what was it like to um to run two nonprofits like simultaneously like what was the relationship between the two and like yeah so um as i mentioned um art you we actually kind of began um kind of piloting this idea of like steam with art you initially um and i would say like um that's kind of where the two overlapped a little bit but i think like they are separate in that for she cooks are we do do very different events and outreach um whereas for art you i think like the main focus is making sure that we still did more pure arts outreach and we also like organize the showcase every year so um i think there is like um they overlapped in the sense that we would do like more uh generic steam workshops you know where we took like topics like biology neuroscience and eco ecology and, and combine them with art and, and so in, in this way um team members from both organizations would often work together to like make these workshops and conferences happen um so that was kind of how they overlapped interesting um i guess back to the questions that people asked initially um do you have any tips on expanding a school-based organization yeah um that's a great question i think like uh, for me in school, I, I founded our school's FBLA chapter, um, but I think like in terms of like expanding a school club, you should try and like do like community outreach with that club. Um, I think like that's something that I've seen a lot of clubs do when they're trying to expand their outreach. Um, you can also try and hold like conferences and events um, for that specific club. Um, maybe like forming partnerships with other of the same clubs at different schools and trying to hold larger events. Um, and I think that's one really solid way in which you can go about um, expanding a school club. And you could also like do fundraising for different causes and things like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, two questions I think sort of go hand in hand. What are you most proud of? And is there anything that you wish you did differently like throughout high school? Yeah, um, I think like personally, what I'm most proud of is just like um, the community work I've been able to do. I think like honestly, the most meaningful part of my high school experience has just been getting to like work with youth one on one and kind of getting to know all of these students and form long lasting friendships and relationships with them. I think like that's something that's kind of kept me going and just seeing like the incremental like change in them and like their increasing desire and enthusiasm every year that we return has been really fulfilling for me um and it just makes me happy whenever we do an event and like people you know come and tell me that they really enjoyed it or that they learned so much from it um i think that sorry what was the other question um like is there anything throughout high school that you wish you did differently um yeah i think like for me personally, I feel like high school, I was very busy um, and I kind of like didn't take very much time, I guess, to like um, do more social things, I guess, and get to like know the people in my school community very well. So I feel like that's something that I would try and do more of um, in hindsight. But um, I also think like, you know, there are only a certain number of things that you can prioritize and you kind of just have to like make that list and like go with your gut about what you want to like prioritize. And I think like for me, um, via all of like the programs and, you know, different events I've been to, I've formed so many amazing communities and friends that I think will last throughout, um, you know, college and stuff. So I think like just finding those networks and really trying to make um, friends is like, a really great way to kind of keep yourself like uplifted and motivated throughout high school.
Yeah, that definitely makes sense because like people in high school, I feel like focus so much on like, oh, I have to study so I can like get a good grade on this test and I have to like do like all these like 20 extracurriculars so I can yeah. get into college and they just like forget to um, like make time for like yeah. little things for sure. Um, I'm so sorry guys, like there's so many questions and we're sort of coming to a close. So if you still have those questions, definitely um, contact her. And I guess just to end it, like, is there any more like advice that you didn't really mention that you have for like people who are around our age to like sort of like do big things, succeed in life, stuff like that, like any more advice? Um, I think I would just like kind of like return to my earlier takeaway which was that you should try and like step out of your thought bubble um and kind of like get to know different communities and kind of like try and bring your voice into those communities i also think that it's just really important to like have a very strong sense of self and like know who you are um as cliche as it may seem because i think like if you aren't being authentic then ultimately you aren't really going to be happy with what you're doing um and i think like um especially like you know i would say do what you're doing because you love it and have college or whatever be like a consequence of that because i think like as long as you you're really good at what you're doing you're going to be able to be successful in, in it like no matter where you end up for college like cs especially is such a democratizing field like you can literally learn so much of it by yourself and go to like um a not very well-known college and still get a really good job so i think like that's something that you should always keep in mind like as a perspective like going to like an ivy league or any like big name school is not really any measure of who you are or any end-all be-all of like how well you'll end up doing in life so i'd say that's my final advice yeah like thank you so much for coming today and like sharing all this like advice and information about yourself i think that this was super helpful for a ton of people and yeah, just like, thank you so much for taking the time out of your day to um, like come and speak. And obviously like for the audience, if you have any more questions, feel free to get in touch with her through like these um, platforms. Yeah, for sure. Uh, thank you so much for the opportunity. I really loved speaking and yeah, feel free to connect with me at any, any of these um, links here. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, thank you so much. And thank you to all of you for coming. I think um, Archer has like a slide to show just like as a thank you slide. But yeah, thank you all so much. Um, Again, yeah, uh, thank you to Savita. Uh, let me just share my screen real quick. Uh, thank you guys. Oh, wrong one. Oh, yeah, make sure to apply for these positions. By the way. <laughs> yeah. Um, Sorry about that. Anyway, thank you guys so much for joining us today, uh, regardless of what speakers you joined. Um, just a friendly reminder, today we especially about kind of youth empowerment, and here at NGN, that's uh, one of our, our biggest features. We strive to help out youth in any way we can, and again, we have a competition, uh, the NGN Global Conference, where you can pitch your ideas, pitch your nonprofits. Uh, there's a $15,000 prize pool. Remember to follow us on Instagram, ask any questions, reach out to Washington State NGN, Facebook, Twitter, all that jazz. Uh, we have so much to reach out with. And with that, I think we are good. Thank you guys so much. You just feel free to leave as you go. Fill out the survey. Fill out the survey. Uh, $30 Amazon gift card if you fill out the post-workshop survey. Um, it's our raffle. My team should be putting that in chat right there. If you have any last questions, can't exactly see the chat. Show the positions again. Yes, positions are right here. This is for the national team. Uh, you apply the link at the bottom. Uh, it's an amazing opportunity in case you're excited about kind of a variety of topics. You have kind of leadership positions finance and accountant side administration covers a whole lot awesome opportunity